The Tolkien Road, Episode 97, The Lord of the Rings, The Palantir. Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to the Tolkien Road, a long walk through Middle-earth. On this episode, we continue our journey through The Lord of the Rings with Book 3, Chapter 11, The Palantir. Before we get started, why not hop on over to iTunes and leave The Tolkien Road a rating and feedback? It's a great way to show your support for the show and takes less than a minute. Or you can stop by TolkienRoad.com, learn about previous episodes, and say hey. We're also on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Tolkien Road. Thanks for listening, and enjoy. Hello everyone, welcome to the Tolkien Road, episode 97, Lord of the Rings, book 3, chapter 11. Chapter 11. The Palantir. What? Yeah. This is like episode what, 98? I just said 97, weren't you listening? The year you, uh, the year you graduated high school, right? Huh, I thought it was 98. Yeah. I mean... I know I graduated high school in 97, but I thought that... Um, I'm pretty sure this is 98, or 97. I thought last week's was 97. Hold on, we'll look right now. Sorry. Oh, got to be confusing. Nope, know. it was 96. Last week was 96, oh. so this is 97. Whoa. So we got, uh, let's see, 98. We only have two more episodes to figure out what our big hundredth celebratory episode's going to sound like. Mm-hmm. Yep. Or if it's even going to be big at all. It will be big. Yeah. It's got to be. Or we could um, just wait, and as our good friend Matt Scarrant suggested, we celebrate the 11 first. The 11 first. Episode. I kind of like that. I kind of like that, too. Yeah. It seems a bit more appropriate. Mm-hmm. I mean, 100 is a cool number. It's a century. Right. You know, it's a dollar. Mm-hmm. 100 cents, I mean. Um... But 111st just seems more Tolkien-ish. Yeah. Yeah. So if you guys have any ideas how we should celebrate. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, it's cool. We'll, 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 like set a we'll, be like, we'll be like woohoo, you know, when we get to 100. Maybe you'll be like woohoo. I'll be like woohoo! Yeah. Yeah. And then I'll set off fireworks. Like a, like a dragon firework like Gandalf does? Yes. That'd be cool. I've been looking online to see where I could... Find one. Uh-huh. I have a couple weeks to get it figured out, I guess. Cool. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, let's let's talk some correspondence. Well, um, oh yeah. Oh, you know what? We need to um, we need to do a uh, we need to do a drawing for this month. I don't even know. Oh. I don't even know what I'm gonna give away, but I'm gonna go ahead and do the drawing. Okay. Yeah. All right. You wanna give away that T-shirt? What's that? You wanna give away your T-shirt? That doesn't fit. <laughs> <laughs> My, uh, it's an cool, awesome cool story, Bilbo t-shirt. Yeah, it's a cool t-shirt. Uh, I I don't think that would be as good as the prize, but if anybody wants my cool story, Bilbo t-shirt, um, it only slightly worn. Um, Size medium. Yeah, it uh, it shrunk a little too much, I guess, when you washed it. Yeah, I know. I was surprised. I didn't think it was going to shrink. Just, yeah, my my guns, my guns yeah. are too too big. It's <laughs> a little too tight. Too on much arms. ammunition in there. That's right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, if anybody doesn't think that's weird, we're <laughs> slightly worn. Uh, it will be washed. That's you what know. washing machines are for, yeah, seriously. Um, uh, you're welcome to it. So, first first come, first serve. So, yeah, let Greta know at TolkienRoadPodcast at gmail.com if you want my cool story, Bilbo t-shirt. Yep. Um, and if anybody wants to buy me another one that's maybe a large size, that's cool too. But, you know, no pressure. If you want to see what it looks like, it's from snorgtees.com. Yeah, there you go. S-N-O-R-G-T-E-E-S.com. Mm-hmm. All right, well, let's do our drawing. Yeah, let's do it. Well, so last month it was Margaret Lyon was the winner. Oh, And yeah. um, so I think given we don't want to have it two months, you know, have her be the winner two months in a row, the same person be the winner two months in a row, you know what I'm saying? Oh, right. So everybody gets a chance. Sure, you know yeah, saying? that seems fair. Yeah. So, um, not because of anything against Margaret, but just because she was the winner last month. So, uh, we got, we'll do 
one through nine, mm -hmm. number one through nine, and if it mm -hmm. happens to be five, which I think was Margaret's number, we'll roll again. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Here we go. All right. Hey, Siri, pick a random number between one and nine. Random number between one and nine is four. 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 All right, let's see here. Who's so that is four? Brian Orr. Brian, Brian Orr congratulations. Yes, Brian. So I will let you know soon what your prize is. Yeah. Yeah. So I hadn't thought. I got to figure it out. I just hadn't figured it out for this month yet. You know, you're a thoughtful person. Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. So you just want to be sure everybody gets a, a good a good thing. You know, right. you don't want to be hasty about making your decision. Mm hmm. So preach it. Yeah. That's what it is. All right, uh, let's see here. So, um, if you'd like to, if you'd like to be a part of a drawing in the future, um, head on over to Patreon.com/slash Tolkien Road, and you can learn more about mm -hmm. becoming a patron of the Tolkien Road podcast. Okay. Um, and you can get like cool uh, free videos and stuff like that too. Yeah. So yeah. head on over there, and learn more. TolkienRoad.com or Patreon.com/slash Tolkien Road. Every little bit that is contributed is highly, highly appreciated. Highly appreciated. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. So, Greta. Very much appreciated. Yes. Correspondence. Correspondence. Cor Captain of Correspondence, what you got? <clears throat> All right. Well, first and foremost, excuse me, I have a frog in my throat this morning. Yeah. <clears> throat> I'm drinking enough throat. coffee, I guess. Yeah. Or maybe too much coffee, not enough water. Not enough water. Um, there, water. Okay, so, a secret word update. I actually had to go back and, like, write this all out because I was starting to get very confused uh -huh. about who guessed and who chose and all this stuff. And so I actually have my own little document that's just dedicated to secret words. Who knew it could be so complicated? Who knew? I know, right? I think what throws me off is we're, like, a week off. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's not, like, whatever. Maybe you need to <clears> guess <throat> Maybe you need to guess your own secret word before anybody else can, oh. and then you can get it back on track. Maybe that's what we need to do. Yeah. Yeah, that might help. Um, but now I've taken the time to put together this list, so I think I think I've got it. <clears throat> so anyway, well, that's good to know. It is good to know. I was I was I mean I got to be honest I was losing some sleep about whether we get the <laughs> secret word right or not. Seriously, me too. I don't want, I don't want to let our listeners down. Well, so who got it? Who guessed it last week? All right. So <clears throat> last week's word was mystery. Uh huh. And Shannon guessed it. Right on. So, <clears throat> geez, I keep clearing my throat. I'm gonna, I'm, I mean, I'm gonna fire you soon. You can't clear your throat. <clears throat> okay, it's not I think that'll do it. Sorry, guys. Jeez. All right. So Shannon guessed last week's as well. So Shannon has guessed correctly two weeks in a row, mm -hmm. which means she's picking today's word and next week's word. But that also means she won't be guessing right. either one of those words. Right. So, everybody who wants a shot at your secret word, the next two weeks, it's going to be your best shot. Yeah. Because Shannon's quick. Because Shannon, quick She's draw. real quick. That's right. So, if you only get I, I told her word, I was nicknaming her quick draw. That's right, you did. Yeah, because she's right. so quick quick on the draw with the so secret word. So quick, yes. So, um, good job, Shannon. Mm hmm And everybody else. Um, and it's, other people are, are guessing it, too. Oh, yeah, other, other people, people are. are it's just, just that they're... Coming in second, third, and fourth, and fifth yeah. to Shannon. Mm -hmm. So, um, next couple weeks, Shannon will be picking, and everybody else should guess. That's right. Yeah. All right. So, um, and thank you to um, Aaron, who chose last week's secret word of mystery. Boom. It was a good one. And um, Shannon chose today's. So, everybody listen up. See if you can figure it out. All righty. All right. Next order of business is... Let's see here. Uh, well, Rob gave me a new title. Uh, Viscount of Verse. <laughs> Man. He said he had to break out the thesaurus for that one. Yeah, I don't Viscount. even know what Viscount means. I told him I have to look it up it's in the It's like dictionary. an ancient you know, title. I don't know. It's like a another word for like a duke or something like that. I don't know. Oh. I, I, I Maybe like Viceroy. You know, it's almost like maybe related to Viceroy or something like that. Oh, uh, yeah. well, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe thanks, it's like Viscount. Rob. You know, like a count would be like a. Oh, is that how you say it? Person. You think viscount? No, vi of... viscount is how you say it. But I'm saying like maybe oh. it's like related to like the idea of a vice president, like a vice count. Oh, like a second in command kind yeah. of like. 
like a right hand man or woman. Let's look it up. Oh, I'm Let's... looking it up right now. I well, got it. I'm going to beat you to it. Nope, I got I'm it right here. Let's see. So nope. a viscount is a British nobleman. It's a British nobleman ranking, ranking above, above a baron, baron and, and below an earl. All right. So I'm a nobleman, mm-hmm. and I'm above a baron and below an earl. Yeah. I'll take it. I'll take it. I'm always about being above a baron. Yeah. Baron. Oh, it's like Baron and Luthien, but not. Okay. Um, speaking of Baron and Luthien, actually, Josh told me Josh was late on getting his haiku in this week. Uh-huh. Um, and he apologized for being being late, but then he said it's because he's been reading Tolkien's Requiem. Oh, cool. So I said, awesome. you know what? No apology necessary. I've heard that's a good book. Yeah, I've heard it's... I think it is. I, actually, I've read it. Yeah. It is. It's It is. It's good. It's mm-hmm. worth y'all's time, for sure. Um, uh, you can get... Speaking of Tolkien's Requiem, uh, you can get a... You can go to um, truemythspress.com and you can purchase a signed first printing. Limited edition signed first printing. Oh, of, Tolkien's Requiem. There's still some available. That sounds pretty special. Um, and you got to act fast because I'm actually going to be taking them down soon. I think so. Um, you know, so don't delay. Yeah. Be hasty. That's right. Be Just hasty. Just once. Be hasty for that. Yeah, it's worth it for sure. That's right. Um, and also speaking of new titles, um, Mary Grace has a new one for you. Ah. Knowledgeable nerd. Knowledgeable nerd. Knowledgeable I am. Knowledgeable nerd. When yep. it comes to Tolkien, I definitely am. That's a true story. That's right. And she, just kind of a little carrot to keep you guys listening through the whole episode, Mary Grace sent in two haiku, Mm. one of which is, wait for it, in Elvish. Oh, wow. Good luck pronouncing that. I was going to say, you're reading it. Oh, okay. (laughs) I told her that I would butcher it and that you would be reading it. We also have a very, we've got a nice note. Um, I guess this this is from the website, truemyths.org. From, uh, what's her name? Monique. Monique in Massachusetts. Yes, Monique in Massachusetts. She sent us a very nice comment on the website. She says, just wanted to let you know how much I enjoy your podcast. It's fun listening to you and Greta. I found you around New Year's, and I've listened to all of the Fellowship of the Ring episodes, and I'm now catching up on the Two Towers episodes. I plan to reread The Silmarillion this summer, so I'm saving those episodes for later. Your reminiscences about the movies also hit home because I think we're the same age. Fellowship of the Ring came out in college, and my now husband and I went to see them on dates. Anyways, keep up the great work. From Monique in Massachusetts, a fellow Tolkien lover. Thanks, Monique. So that's awesome. Great I to love hear from hearing you. from listeners. I do too. That we haven't heard from before. That's right. It's always great to hear from uh, going. hear from new folks out there. I know there's. No, there's a lot of a lot of you out there, and it's always great to hear from uh, from you. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, thank you, Monique, for your kind words and for listening. We enjoy the fact that you enjoy listening to us talk about Tolkien. Absolutely, mm-hmm. for real, Zio. Awesome. And then our last order of correspondence um, is from. Well, we've ma- mentioned Matt mm-hmm. already, but he also made the note that. Um, he found the rhyme of lore, tall ships and tall kings, which Gandalf recites in this chapter to be one of the shortest. He said it may be one of the shortest of Tolkien's poems, but it's also one of my favorites. Mm. It has a mystical quality to it that I can't really explain a feeling of thousands of years of history in a few short words. Yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. It's a beautiful poem. I know we'll, we'll talk about it on the episode. And then in addition to his haiku, Matt also sent in a poem for the end of book three. So nice. that'll be a fun way to wrap things up. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 He ended his email with, may the Tolkien road go on and on for a good long entish while with many more listeners on the way. Boom. Yes. Thank you, Matt. Amen you for to that, the, uh, Matt. Thank you for the well wishes. Yes. And for listening. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. All right. So that's the correspondence. All right. Knock that out. All right. We ready to roll? Let's do it. All right. So, uh, we are, so last couple, last couple of weeks, last couple of episodes, we've been just kind of hanging out in Isengard, mm-hmm. right? Hanging out under the shadow right. of the tower. Uh, last, last week there was a little bit of a reckoning with Saruman, yes. and now it's time to uh, set out from Isengard, right, and kind of head back towards 
Um, Helm's Deep, right? Yeah, head back towards Helm's Deep and then eventually towards Edoras and, you know, regroup. Like, yeah. the whole point is we, we learn pretty quickly that this is not the the end. Like, this was not, this was merely a first battle mm-hmm. in a much larger war. And so there's much more to be done at this point. Yes. There's much more to be done. So, the crew, the company, uh, the fellowship, and the riders of Rohan are setting out from Isengard. Um, I wanted to read this first little bit about uh, about their you know beginning to get on the road and the Ents. Um, so it says, um, Gan- uh, When Gandalf and his companions and the king with his riders set out again from Isengard, Gandalf took Merry behind him and Aragorn took Pippin. Two of the king's men went on ahead, uh, riding swiftly, and passed soon out of sight down into the valley. The others followed at an easy pace. Ents in a solemn row stood like statues at the gate, with their long arms uplifted, but they made no sound. Merry and Pippin looked back when they had passed some way down the winding road. Sunlight was still shining in the sky, but long shadows reached over Isengard, gray ruins falling into darkness. Treebeard stood alone there now, like the distant stump of an old tree. The hobbits thought of their first meeting upon the sunny ledge far away on the borders of Fangorn. They came to the Pillar of the White Hand. The pillar was still standing, but the graven hand had been thrown down and broken into small pieces. Right in the middle of the road, the long forefinger lay, white in the dusk, its red nail darkening to black. The Ents pay attention to every detail, said Gandalf. They rode on, and evening deepened in the valley. Now, I don't understand why Gandalf makes that remark. Yeah, I was wondering about that, too. I, I tried to piece it together, and I was like, I don't understand. what What's he saying? Is he referring to the fact that they had the forefinger laying... On the ground, like, um, in the middle of the road, the long forefinger lay white in the dusk, its red, its red nail darkening to black. I mean... Well, the white hand is representative of Saruman. Right, yeah. Right? It was his, like, kind of brand. Right. So maybe it's just a way of, of him saying that... The Ents even made sure that this was thrown down. Yeah. They didn't have to. They didn't have they to didn't bother have with this. They didn't have to, right? Because it was just pointing the way to Isengard, yeah. right? Right. And so, yeah. I guess that's all there is to it. I don't know. Yeah. But there's more. Okay. But I know. I, I kind of read that a couple times, too, going, hmm, what detail? What deep, amazing thing are you trying yeah, to say I here, Yeah, I know, Tolkien? right? Yeah. I know. I think... Um, it's like, actually, I was just trying to say the Ents threw down the white hand. Right. Exactly. You know? <laughs> exactly. And I liked, you know, I, I thought that the, you know, this part of the chapter needed a pop of color, so I, you know, thought I'd throw in the note about the red nail. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah, I think that's probably all it is. Okay. It's just Fair saying enough. that not only did they destroy all of Isengard, but they basically destroyed every, well, everything related to it. If anything any, that if any of you other wise guys out there see any deeper significance in it that we're totally missing yeah. then let us know. Maybe there's something in Untold Tales about it. Untold Tales? Yeah. Probably, although that book has never been published and doesn't even exist. Untold Tales? What is it? <laughs> what? It's Unsomething Tales, isn't it? Unfinished Tales. Oh, Unfinished Tales. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Jeez. Oh. Oh. <clears throat> you know what I meant. Yeah, but now, now, un- <laughs> untold tales is going to become a thing. Now, it's going to become untold. the mysterious, mm-hmm. like you know, mysterious unpublished Tolkien book that everyone wants. <laughs> everyone no wants, and nobody can find. That's right. <laughs> un- I bet it that's written down in Untold Tales somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, yeah, maybe there or in um, letters. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe maybe somebody wrote Tolkien a letter asking about it. Did you research it at all? What? Did you research this at all? In letters, maybe? No. No. I mean, I didn't think it was that significant, you know? Okay. So. All right. Well, I was if just, any of you listeners, yeah. you know, think it's significant and can tell us why, please do. If you can find the reference in Untold Tales, yeah. let us know. Please do. All right. So, they're heading out, um, and... Um, what time of day is it? I don't know. You tell is me. Is it night? Oh, it is night. Are we riding far tonight, Gandalf? Asked mm-hmm. Mary. So it's night. And it's probably not, like, too dark yet. Yeah. It's not like the middle of the night. Because they said they're going to ride a few hours before they rest. Well, I thought these words from Gandalf to uh, Mary were interesting. Um, he says, 
Uh, be thankful no longer words were aimed at you. He had his eye, Saruman had his eyes on you. If it is any comfort to your pride, I should say that at the moment you and Pippin are more in his thoughts than all the rest of us. Who you are, how you came there, and why. What you know, whether you were captured, and if so, how you escaped when all the orcs perished. It is with those little riddles that the great mind of Saruman is troubled. A sneer from him, Mary Adoc, is a compliment if you feel honored by his concern. So that's in reference to... Did, did Saruman call Mary Ragtag? Because um, he says, so he says, I don't know how you feel. He says to Gandalf, I don't know how you feel with small ragtag dangling behind you, but the ragtag is tired. Um, yeah, he, he must so have. I don't... Sa- Saruman referred to Mary as ragtag, or he must have insulted him somehow. Right. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so that's why Gandalf is like, well, if it's any, you know, if it helps your pride any, that's actually uh-huh. a compliment from Saruman. Yeah, it actually, he, Gandalf is basically saying, like, Saruman didn't say this, but it shows that he was kind of, you you perplexed him, right? right. He was like, what the heck? How did right. these, how did this, how did these bunch of little punks, you know, throw, throw me down? Right. 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 Um, exactly. Get me in trouble. Oh, yeah. Um, here it says. Get a ceremony in the chapter four says, and leave behind these cutthroats and the small ragtag that dangle at your tail. Good day. That's right. So, yeah. I see. All right. Um, and Gandalf says, yes, a, a little later in this ride, he says, yes, we have won, but only the first victory, and that in itself increases our danger. There was some link between Isengard and Mordor, which I have not yet fathomed. How they exchange news, I am not sure, but they did so. The eye of Barad-dûr will be looking impatiently towards the wizard's veil, I think, and towards Rohan. The less it seems, the less it sees, the better. Um, so, first victory, um, but things are only going to get more dangerous from here. All right, they've won the battle, not the war. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, so, you know, all of all of this so far is just kind of a preface, a preface to the main concern of the chapter, which is the Palantir, as we know right. from the title. And right. so the whole kind of saga with the Palantir in this chapter begins with Merry and Pippin sleeping right. uh, in the camp. And they, you know, kind of start having a conversation um, right. about... Because Pippin can't sleep. Right, about yeah. uh, specifically the Palantir. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Mary, you know, Mary is kind of trying to get Pippin to let it go and um, and just... And, and what he tells him is, don't meddle in the affairs of wizards. Right. Um, uh, so. Where they are. Mary says, he has grown. Uh, they're talking about Gandalf and how he's changed. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mary says, Pippin, is, Pippin at first um, says he's not changed at all. But Mary says, oh, yes, he is. He has grown or something. He can be both kinder and more alarming, merrier and more solemn than before, I think. He has changed. But we have not had a chance to see how much yet. But think of the last part of that business with Saruman. Remember Saruman was once Gandalf's superior, head of the council, whatever that may be exactly. He was Saruman the White. Gandalf is the White now. Saruman came when he was told, and his rod was taken. And then he was just told to go, and he went. So they find you know, mm-hmm. significance in the fact that Gandalf suddenly seemed to have this power over, over Saruman. Saruman, the power right. to command, right? right? Yep. Um, which was a very, very striking thing yeah. when he told him. Come back, right? Saruman, right. come back. And Saruman was kind of dragged back unwillingly, right? right. right. And then he was um, able to take his staff from him and break it. Exactly. Pretty big deal. Um, so apparently the white in their order of the of the Astari was, had some kind of power, had right. some kind of authority over the rest of, right. over the, rest right. of the wizards. Yeah. And now um, that is transferred from Saruman to Gandalf. Gandalf, right. Pippin says, well, if Gandalf has changed it all, then he's closer than ev- than ever, that's all. Uh, that glass ball now, he seemed mighty pleased with it. He knows or guesses something about it, but does he tell us what? No, not a word. Yet I picked it up and I saved it from rolling into a pool. Here, I'll take that, my lad. That's all. I wonder what it is. It felt so very heavy. Uh, Pippin's voice fell very low as if he was talking to himself. Hello, said Mary. So that's what is bothering you? Now, Pippin, my lad, don't forget Gildor's saying, the one used, the one Sam used to quote. Do not meddle in the affairs of wizards, for they are subtle and quick to anger. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. do not meddle in the affairs of wizards, for they are subtle and quick to anger. Wise words. That needs to go on a t-shirt. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yet words that shall, unfortunately, go unheeded. Yes. By Pippin. Yep. Well, you know Pippin. He's the yeah. uh, fool of a took. That's right. Um, he himself. 
So Mary continues to kind of tell him, look, just go to sleep. Forget about it. It'll all... Forget about the um, ball. You know, we can talk to him about it in the morning yeah. and figure it all out then. Um, Good advice. Yeah. Mary, very but, level-headed. Yeah. Yeah. So Mary falls asleep. Mm-hmm. Pippin, however, you know, we've all been there. Yeah. You know, you just, for some reason, your mind's preoccupied with something and you can't sleep. Right. Um, yeah. as, as try as you might. It's like the more you try to sleep, the, the less you're able to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so Pippin is lying there awake mm-hmm. while Mary and everyone else is asleep. Mm-hmm. And um, and he's just, his mind just won't let go. It says, Mar- Pippin felt again its weight in his hands and saw again the mysterious red depths into which he had looked for a moment. Mm-hmm. He tossed and turned and tried to think of something else. At last, he could he could stand it no longer. He got up and looked around. It was chilly, and he wrapped his cloak about him. The moon was shining cold and white down into the dell, and the shadows of the bushes were black. All about lay sleeping shapes. So he goes, and he finds where Gandalf yep. is laying. Yep. Gandalf is, like, sleeping with the palantir, has mm-hmm. his arms kind of around the palantir. Yeah. And Pippin starts plotting about how he's going to get, get it away from Gandalf. Yeah, there's some, some mischievousness going on here. Yeah. Um, says he stood for a moment... Uh, uh, clasping it. Um, let's see. Clasping what? But he did not put the bundle down. Uh, so he basically takes the palantir. Oh, he tries to take the palantir. It. Then he realizes that if if he takes it, because Gandalf is is gripping it, right? And Gandalf goes to grip it, then he'll. He realizes it's not there. It's not there. He'll wake up and right. so he replaces trouble. it with a rock. That's right. Right, and then takes right. the palant. Pal- How do you say it? Palantir. Palantir. Yeah. Okay. Quickly now, he drew off the cloth, wrapped the stone in it, and kneeling down, uh, laid it. He found so he. I'm sorry. He finds a large a large stone. Yeah. Comes back and he wraps the cloth that had been covering the palantir right. around this large stone and, right. and places it back in Gandalf's hand. So it's the old switcheroo, mm-hmm. the oldest trick in the book. It is the oldest trick in the book. Right. Yep. Um, it's pretty uh, pretty clever. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was the oldest trick, but. Good on Pippin for thinking that far ahead. Right? Most definitely. Most definitely. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, good on well, him. I mean, as far I mean, as you can say, I mean, it's clever. It's clever, clever of him. that's what I mean. The old switcheroo. I wasn't condoning Pippin's actions. Yeah. Disclaimer. Yeah. He shouldn't have done it. It was wrong. Obviously, as we soon find out. Yeah. So... But it's interesting, because it almost... It, this kind of reminded me... Like, it definitely seems to have... This palantir, palantir has, like, a power over him. Yeah. You know, kind of like the ring. Kind of like the ring, yeah. Has over the people that possess it. Yeah. Because it even says in here, it was, he was, like, pulled by a, a power that wasn't his own. It's almost like, I mean, it's almost like, you know, when you consider, um, like, the Silmarils, mm-hmm. the ring, mm-hmm. um, the Palantir, it's, I mean, the whole, the whole idea of the forbidden, the lure of the forbidden object the forbidden fruit. Well, you uh, see it in the, is, the Genesis, right? Yeah. Is like... Well, it seems like it's very primary in Tolkien's storytelling, you know? Yeah. Um, kind of you can't have it, which makes you want it all the more. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, and there's there's that part of it, but there's also like... Um, because it's not just that it's forbidden, it's the it's the idea of what really is. It's like... Um, it's, it's sort of the... And the, these objects that we're talking about have these mysterious capabilities to them, right. like these powers, yeah. this power, yeah, right, mm-hmm. over different beings, right, mm-hmm. to kind of like call to them yeah. in some way. Now, of course, Pippin touched the Palantir briefly when it fell outside right. of Orthanc. So I think that's kind of where it. So it's, it's yeah, like a snake. It's almost like with the ring, right? The more you wear it, the stronger its power over you, right? Yeah, right. Um, and almost like to break its power, you have to give it away. Right. right. Uh, and even then, it still has some power over you. Right. But, um, and it's like with the Palantir, because he touched it briefly, it's got a, it's, it's calling to him now. Right. right. So that's probably, Gandalf foresaw that, which is probably why he took it. It's probably why he has it wrapped in a cloak yeah. as well, right? Right. To protect the direct touch. The direct contact, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Pippin, as soon as he places this rock and takes the Palantir, he kind of realizes what a fool he's being. He says, you idiotic, why don't you read that, you idiotic fool? You idiotic fool. Pippin muttered to himself, you're going to get yourself into frightful trouble. Put it back, quick. But he found now that his knees quaked and he did not dare to go near the near enough the, to the wizard to reach the bundle. I'll never get it back now without waking him, he thought. Not till I'm a bit calmer. So I may as well have a look first. Not just here, though. He stole away and sat down on a green hillock not far from his bed. 
The moon looked in over the edge of the dell. Pippin sat with his knees drawn up and the ball between them. He bent low over it, looking like a greedy child stooping over a bowl of food in a corner away from others. He drew his cloak aside and gazed at it. The air seemed still and tense about him. At first the globe was dark, black as jet, with the moonlight gleaming on its surface. Then there came a faint glow and stir in the heart of it, and it held his eyes so that now he could not look away. Soon all the inside seemed on fire. The ball was spinning, or the lights within were revolving. Suddenly the lights went out. He gave a gasp and struggled, but he remained bent, clasping the ball with both hands. Closer and closer he bent, and then became rigid. His lips moved soundlessly for a while, then with a strangled cry he fell back and lay still. The cry was piercing. The guards leapt down from the banks. All the camp was soon astir. Boom. Boom. So uh, Pippin realizes not only that he's a fool for taking it from Gandalf, mm-hmm. but for wanting it in the first place. Um, pretty pretty frightful stuff yeah, happening absolutely. to him there. But he justifies it, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. It's like as soon as he as soon as he takes the the um cloak off of the palantir, mm-hmm. it says the air seems still and tense about him. First yeah. it was dark, black as jet with the moonlight gleaming on its surface, but then it like comes alive. Yeah. Came a faint glow and a stir in the heart of it and it held his eyes so that now he could not look away. Yep. Uh it almost has this like magnetic Yeah. It's like it, it, it like takes control of him almost. Yeah, you know? Yeah, it does. Um, it does. It seems on fire, the ball was spinning or the lights within were revolving. Suddenly the lights went out. He gave a gasp and struggled, but he remained bent, clasping the ball with both hands. Closer and closer he bent and then became rigid. His lips moved soundlessly for a while, and then with a strangled cry he fell back and lay still. So, um, yeah, bad news for him. Definitely some devilry going on. This is kind of, um, I know we talked about, it's kind of harkens back to the power of the ring, but also it just this description here reminds me of um, Galadriel's mm-hmm. mirror. Definitely. Yeah, I definitely felt that. Uh, was thinking that as well yeah. um, uh, with the way it kind of kind of sucks you in the, this, right. whatever you're seeing and you can't yeah. pull like you can't get away even mm-hmm. if you want to yeah yeah. Um, of course we're going to find out that a large, in large part and it's unclear whether it, this would have been the case otherwise but in large part it, the Palantir seems to have this power over Pippin because of who's on the other side of it mm-hmm. right because it's Sauron on the other side of it um, and so it's not it, it maybe not that the palantir itself is this you know evil object like the mm-hmm. ring is right but um but it's the fact that Saur- Sauron is on the other side of it right exactly it's a powerful object but Sauron is on the other side of it yeah it can be used for you know, you know originally we're going to find out it was used these used objects were, were created yeah. to be used for good right right but he's cast his shadow over it and he's taking control of one, well, it has at least one palantir, so he, you know the whole thing is they're able to. We'll, we'll get to that, I guess. But yeah. Um, so we'll moving on with the actual uh, narrative, and we'll come back mm-hmm. to the nature of the palantir. Okay. Um, Pippin uh, Gandalf discovers the you know Pippin wakes up the whole camp with this cry. Gandalf discovers him and says, "So this is the thief, but you, Pippin, this is a grievous turn on things. The devilry. What mischief has he done to himself and to all of us?" So Pippin is in big trouble. He's in deep, deep trouble. But Pippin is still like in some kind of trance. He even, uh, uh, Pippin uh, cries out, sits up, staring in bewilderment at all the faces around him, pale in the moonlight. And he says, it is not for you, Saruman. I will send for it at once. Do you understand? Say just that. Um, So now he's a puppet. Yeah. It's almost like Sauron speaking through him. Yes. Um, And then... Gandalf calls him back. Peregrine took. Come back. Mm-hmm. And Peregrine, or Peregrine gets his... Pippin gets his wits about him again. Right. He has Gandalf to forgive him. Yeah. Yeah. So Pippin, jumping down a little bit more, has to tell about what he saw. Um, and he says that... Uh, he says, then he came. Um, he said... Well, going back a little bit before that, actually. He says... I took the ball and looked at it. I saw things that frightened me, and I wanted to go away, but I couldn't. And then he came and questioned me, and he looked at me, and and, and that is all I remember. Um, I saw a dark sky and tall battlements and tiny stars. It seemed very far away and long ago, yet hard and clear. Then the stars went in and out. They were cut off by things with wings, very big, I think, really. But in the glass, they looked like bats wheeling around the tower. I thought there were nine of them. One began to fly straight towards me, getting bigger and bigger. It had a horrible... No, no, I can't say. 
I tried to get away because I thought it could it would fly out, but then it had covered all the globe. It disappeared. Then he came. He did not speak so that I could hear words. He just looked, and I understood. So you have come, bla- come back. Why have you neglected to report for so long? I did not answer. He said, Who are you? I still did not answer, but it hurt me horribly, and he pressed me, so I said, A hobbit. Then suddenly he said he seemed to see me, and he laughed at me. It was cruel. It was like being stabbed with knives. I struggled. But he said, Wait a moment. We shall meet again soon. Tell Saruman that this dainty is not for him. I will send for it at once. Do you understand? Say just that. Then he gloated over me. I felt I was falling to pieces. No, no, I can't say any more. I don't remember anything else. Um, so, you know, this P- that's Pippin's description of what it was like to be kind of on, have his hands and be gazing into the Palantir. Right. And, it, it, and we learned some kind of, we seem to learn some interesting things about Sauron and Saruman's relationship here, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Now, for a while, we've known that Saruman um, is trying to was trying to set himself up as a, uh, you know, as kind of a rival power to right. Sauron, right? Right, threatening. He was yeah. creating his own armies, his own orcs, right? Um, you know, and he was trying to, he was basically trying to take over Rohan and build up, start to build up his own empire because right. he knew Sauron's empire was on the rise, right? But some of the things that Sauron says here, because apparently at first he 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 thinks he's going to be speaking to Saruman, right? And so he tells he tells the person on the other end, "So you have come back? Why have you neglected to report for so long?" It's almost like he's expecting Saruman to he's been expecting Saruman to report to him, right? Like he's so, a right hand man. So there's almost this idea at which maybe originally Saruman was had kind of come over to Sauron's side Mm -hmm. and then had decided that thought better of it and decided that he wanted to set himself up as his own power Mm. you know so it's interesting to think about all the craftiness of on Saruman's part Mm -hmm. yeah you're right you know um, all the things almost like a bit of a coup right yeah um you know, it, it, Sar- Saruman. Him. Saruman was very. He was. He was just maneuvering. I mean, yeah. he was like he was totally manipulating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, even He's to the double point, agent. Even to the point where, well, no, but like a double agent would be like if he had still been on the side of the fellowship. But oh, that's right. You know what I'm saying? But you can't be on appear to be on Sauron's side, but be on your own side. That's kind of a double agency kind of thing. Don't I guess think? maybe. I yeah. guess that would be a double agent. That double. stuff all gets really confusing. Yeah. You know, whenever like in movies, they're like. You know, oh, I'm a, really a spy for these guys, but no, I'm really a spy for the guys that you thought mm-hmm. I was a spy for, right. a spy against. You yeah, know? but then I'm really a spy. And it's like, but hey, it keeps, it keeps things interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I guess at some point it just gets confusing, and you're yeah. like, really, like how yeah. can you keep how can you keep that story up? That's um, true. But uh, but anyway, so Saruman, um, Saruman and Sauron were apparently in cahoots at one point, but. Right. But then Saruman had been kind of broke. I mean, he went right broke, in silent broke away from Sauron, right. and Sauron may have not been completely aware that he had. So Sauron at this point thinks that Pippin is with Saruman. Right. Right. He thinks yeah. he's with Saruman and Arzingar. And so he gives him a message for Saruman. Right. right. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's why Pippin, when he woke up, when he had first seen, when he was still in a trance and had seen Gandalf the White, mm-hmm. he had thought Saruman and thought to deliver oh. this message to Saruman. Right. And it's interesting That's, that Pippin, yeah. like, basically just mimics the same, the words, he mimic, mimics the words mm-hmm. that... Well, it shows the power, right? Yeah. Of Saruman. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, Sauron. Sorry. So, <clears throat> um, but fortunately, you know, Gandalf doesn't seem to think that Pippin has taken any long-term significant harm. Right. So, mm-hmm. that's yeah. the, that's the good news of all this, but, um, but the question still remains, like, this, the, this is maybe sped things, sped the urgency of things up a little bit. Because right. now Sauron is going to be suspecting uh, that something, some strange things are going on in Isengard. Right. He's probably going to try to he's investigate it further. He's probably going to investigate Isengard and he's going to figure out yeah. what happened there. He may have thought before, like, okay, I've got Saruman over here, you know, who I can who I can kind of, kind of trust mm-hmm. at this point. But now he's going to be thinking to himself, oh, wait, maybe something has changed at Isengard. Mm-hmm. So... Um, and it's also in light of, in light of, um, and so the, uh, Gandalf sends Merry and Pippin away and he discusses with Theoden and Aragorn, um, 
the consequences of all of this. And, you know, to sum it up, he basically says, There remains a short while of doubt which we must use. The enemy, it is clear, thought that the stone was in Orthanc. Why should he not? And that, therefore, the hobbit was captive there, driven to look in that glass for his torment by Saruman. That dark mind will be filled now with the voice and face of the hobbit and with expectation. It may take some time before he learns his error. We must snatch that time. We have been too leisurely. We must move. The neighborhood of Isengard is no place now to linger in. I will ride ahead at once with Peregrine Took. It will be better for th- for him than laying in the dark while others sleep. I will keep Eomer and ten riders, said the king. They shall ride with me at early day. The rest may go with Aragorn and ride as soon as they have a mind. As you will, said Gandalf, but make all the speed you may to, c- to the cover of hill of the hills to Helm's Deep. So, uh, Gandalf, Aragorn, Theoden, they say, okay, it's time for us to get really good to move on. We're, mm-hmm. we're, we're kind of, we're taking our leisurely time, yep. but Sauron is not now going to be, to be hasty. Sauron's going to be speeding things up. Yeah. Time, yeah. time to be hasty. Yeah. Yeah. Time to be hasty. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the shadow is growing, right? I mean, they thought they had escaped it. They thought they had a good, right. a good, uh, lead on it. <clears throat> Excuse me. But now it's clear that it will probably catch up with them. Right. And speaking, sooner. speaking of shadows, um, shadow facts. No, we're not there oh, yet. Fudge. No, not, not that kind of shadow. Oh. Um, the Nazgul, right? So, oh yeah, these guys are uh, creepy. Even even as Gandalf and uh, Theoden and Aragorn kind of make their decision on next steps, mm-hmm. it says a moment at that moment a shadow fell over them. Mm-hmm. The bright moonlight seemed to be suddenly cut off. Several of the riders cried out and crouched, holding their arms above their heads as if to ward off a blow from above. A blind fear and a deadly cold fell on them. Cowering, they looked up. A vast wing shaped. Shape, a vast winged shape passed over the moon like a black cloud. It wheeled and went north, flying at a greater speed than any wind of Middle Earth. The stars fainted before it. It was gone. It's interesting, like, we find out it's a Nazgul, which of mm-hmm. course is the, you know, again, uh, one of the nine, right? One right. of the black riders, but mm-hmm. mounted on um, this strange beast, right? These are the same guys that we met in the Fellowship, right? right. That were after them at Bree and all that stuff. But they were riding horses then. Right, but now they've upgraded. Right. To flying machines. Right. Okay. Not to their not to flying machines, but to these like strange well, flying I know. dragons. I'm saying machines in a yeah. tongue in cheek way. Um so They're like pterodactyls kind of, aren't they? Yeah, there's some weird some strange beast, mm-hmm. right? They're they're kinda of, sorta of dragons, but not dragons. You know, they're it's like not, a dragon and a dinosaur and a bird. Yeah, and it's like a snake a mixed snake. together. It's so yeah. nasty. Yeah. Um not not something you want to keep for a pet. No, this unless, is not the unless you're one of those people who's into like weird pets, right? This is not the cute no. kind of mutt that we think of. No, no. Um, but they must be huge, right? Because it talks about them like it basically covered the moon, right? Yeah. Hence the reason for the shadow, right? So it blotted out all the stars and the moon, like right. It's gotta have a nasty big wingspan, right? Yeah, yeah. It's pretty big, um, and it's interesting to go back and recount Pippin's. Vision when he was looking into the palantir. Oh right! When he yeah. says, um, he says, then uh, the stars went in and out. They were cut off by things with wings, very big, I think, really. But in the glass, they looked like bats wheeling around the tower. I thought there were nine of them. One began to fly straight towards me, getting bigger and bigger. It had a horrible, no, no, I can't say. So it makes me almost think that like this was that he was, he was actually seeing this thing leave. No, he was actually seeing it leave. Oh, um, Barador. And Mordor and fly towards them, which if that's the case, man, these things are fast because that's pretty long distance. Yeah, to cover. That, so you think he's heading to an Isengard, right? This Nazgul is. Well, we don't. We don't. It seems to be. I mean, it seems to be. It, it's definitely come from Mordor, right? Right. Yeah. So, um, and they're still pretty close to Isengard in mm-hmm. the Grand. Like you know, you look at your map. I mean, they're still. Um. Right. I mean, here's there's. Barador, that's that's or there's Barador, that's mm-hmm. what Pippin was seeing, mm-hmm. oh, and then okay. they're over here, right? Yeah, so they are far. So this yeah. thing flew. I mean, that's you know, well, that's like four hundred miles, five hundred miles. So that only would have because okay, so if Pippin saw it leave in the Palantir, yeah, and now they're seeing it in real life. That yeah, that'd be wicked fast, right? Yeah, yeah, really fast. Mm-hmm. So, um. Of course, we don't we don't know how long their conversation was between Aragorn and Gandalf, and uh, that's true. We don't know exactly. That can't have been more Theoden. than an hour. Yeah. So, 
Um, so anyway, we don't know if Pippin was actually seeing that. Maybe mm-hmm. maybe Sauron gave it some kind of a push with his magic or something mm-hmm. like that. But um, yeah. and you know, it's it's creatures that you know it's it's faster to travel in the air. You know, yeah, that's true. It's straight as the crow know, flies. As the crow flies. Yeah, that's right. So, dude, that's such a creepy shadow. And it, must have, <coughs> it feels like it it had like a um, the shadow itself almost had some kind of power, mm-hmm. like the shadow that it cast. Right. You know what I mean? So it talks about how several of the riders cried out and crouched, holding their arms above their heads as if to ward off a blow from above. Well, you remember hearing about like the oppressive, like whenever the nine riders were around. There yeah, was kind that's of this true. Yeah, that and then it talks within. about the blind fear and a deadly cold. Right. Um, yeah. So that, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. It does that make there would sense, be. yeah. Um, but it's interesting. It's not just any old shadow. What Gandalf says when he says Nazgul, he said, The messenger of Mordor, the storm is coming. The mm-hmm. Nazgul have crossed the river. Ride, ride, wait not for the dawn. Let not the swift wait for the slow. Ride. Yeah. So I think the river, as I was thinking about it, I don't, I don't think he's referring to the Isen River. I think he's referring to um, the Anduin, uh, which is... You know the river, the big long river that goes like through the uh, the middle of Middle Earth, right? That's the river they were traveling down from Lorien, from Lothlorien to the Falls of Raros. Oh yeah, right. And it, and it travels all the way into Gondor, like the Minas Tirith, Osgiliath region. So I think what he's referring to is the fact that the Nine have crossed the Anduin River. And what is what's that significance? Well, it's kind of like the dividing line in that time was. Gondor, the the free regions were on this side, were on the west side of the river, oh. and the east side was kind of like, you know, the the wild, you know, uncontrolled region, right? Oh, okay. what, you go over there and you're on your own, right? So they've ca- they've crossed basically from the east into the west to the right. free land. Yeah, it's, kind of, it's, it's like kind of cross the crossing of the Rubicon, you know, like that ancient term. Oh, uh, right. right, or the Tiber. Well, uh, the the Rubicon, right, was the ancient thing. The um, hold on, let me find the reference. Uh, let's see, crossing the Rubicon uh, means to pass a point of no return, and refers to Julius Caesar's armies crossing of the Rubicon River in the north of Italy in 49 uh-huh. BC, which was considered an act of insurrection and treason. So it's almost like this is like the. This oh, is like the yeah. sign that war is upon us, right? Ah, Mordor is coming and war is is coming now, okay. right? Okay. Because yeah. for a time, right, Mordor has been been operating, but it's kind of they've been operating in the shadows. Mm-hmm. But now, this is the sign that like, uh oh, they mean business now, right? Mm. War may the war may be starting. So where are where is the company right now? Where is are the they com- on the other side of the river yet, or no? Who are you talking about? I'm talking about Gandalf and his. Posse. No, they're up here, right? They're you got to look at the map. I don't have a map. Well, you need, get, you need to get yourself one. <sighs> they're up here, and right, Isengard is right there. Oh, so Isengard's on the west side. The, of the and river. there's the Isen River. Oh. And yeah, but it's way over here, right? Yeah. This is like this is several hundred miles from from that area, so. They've got a long way to go before they're even where the main action is happening, which is down here, Minas Tirith, and that's where mm-hmm. Gandalf says he's going to go um, with Pippin. Um, okay. So I see. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's okay. That's kind of the lay of the land. Okay. All right. Yes. Um, but Thanks. the the Anduin is the river that's been crossed, and that's the sign that like war is upon Got it. is upon us right yeah it's upon Rome. the war has the war has yeah. the real war has started okay uh, got it yeah um so gandalf uh takes off on shadowfax as you were referring to mhm um shadowfax and he takes pip he takes pippin with him mhm um it says pippin was recovering he was warm but the wind in his face was keen and refreshing he was with gandalf the horror of the stone and of the hideous shadow over the moon was fading. Things left behind in the mists of the mountains or in a passing dream. He drew a deep breath. I did not know you rode bareback, Gandalf. You have it a saddle or a bridle. I do not ride elf fashion except on Shadowfax, said Gandalf. But Shadowfax will have no harness. You do not ride Shadowfax. He is willing to carry you or not. If he is willing, that is enough. It is then his business to see that you remain on his back unless you jump off into the air. How fast is he going? asked, Ga- asked Pippin. Fast by the wind, but very smooth. And how light his footfalls are. 
He is running now as fast as the swiftest horse could gallop, answered Gandalf, but that is not fast for him. The land is rising a little here and is more broken than it was beyond the river. But see how the white mountains are drawing near under the stars. Yonder are the three hern mount are the three hern peaks like black spears. It will not be long before we reach the branching roads and come to the deeping coombe where the battle was fought two nights ago. So Shadowfax is fast. He's uh, really fast. Yeah, and you don't you don't uh, ride Shadowfax. He carries you. I think that's awesome. Yeah. I kind of snickered at that. Yeah, son, you don't ride Shadowfax. He carries you. He carries you. Yeah. With his permission. Mm-hmm. And he won't carry you if you, want, if you ever want to. That's right. Yeah. Um, that's great. Maybe that's why Shadow is part of his name. If I had if I had a fax machine, I would call it Shadow Fax. Would you? Yeah. You should. Yeah. If anybody had Shadow fax machines anymore. It would be the fastest fax machine in the world. I haven't thought about fax machines in a long time. Yeah. Dang. Remember when that was like the new cool thing? Yeah, but people still use them. Yeah, I guess that they have to. Yeah. Um, I'm all about scanners myself. But anyway. Why aren't you cool and technological? Yeah. yeah. Tech you know, savvy. Tech savvy. My middle name. Nerd. Um, but anyway, I was going to say that maybe that's why Shadow is part of his name. Mm-hmm. Because he's so fast that people think he's a shadow. That mm-hmm. he's not real. He's just like a reflection of something that's real. And he's... So fast that it's like a fax machine <laughs> <laughs> sending sending you a copy of something. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was kind of anticlimactic. Yeah, I was like sending you what? Sending you a copy of something. In one of my classes, we were talking about we've been learning about similes mm-hmm. and how a simile is more than just a mere comparison. Because you know, some of the kids will be like. So, if I say that he was, you know, because a simile, the traditional definition is a comparison using like or as. Right, yeah. And so, you know, some people think a simile would be like, um, Joe was as fast as Jeff, you know, because you've got as is there. Yeah. As in there, right? Yeah, yeah. And, but that's not really a simile, right? Because a simile has an extra level of you're comparing something that it's not, that it's normally not like. Right, just, but now that it but is in like, that one yeah. way, it's like it, right, right? Right. So you can come up with some really like lame, like false similes. Uh-huh. Um, you know, like Joe is this. You know, Joe is fast, like as fast as Jeff can run. <laughs> <laughs> Joe is Joe is fast, like a man running as fast as he can. <laughs> uh, you can have fun with that. You know, making bad similes. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Anyway, I don't know why I started talking about it. I don't that. know either. Okay, moving on. But similes can be fun. Maybe, did you want to make a simile for Shadow Facts? Shadow Facts is as fast as Shadow. Shadow, Shadow Facts ran fast wind. as a as it was as a, a fax as a horse trying to get somewhere quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Drop the mic. That's right. Walk off Walk like off. a boss. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um... How about Shadow Fax is as fast as a shadow running in the wind? Faxing something to its friend. Faxing something to its friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Carrying copies. We could have bad. We could have a new like bad simile contest. We could have a new bad speed win. Totally. Huh? You totally. No, I'm win. saying like we could invite people to send us bad similes. Oh. If you want to send us bad similes, send us your best bad simile. That would be fun. Yeah. But it has to be related to something in the chapter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, kind of. No, it does. Okay, fine. It has to be related to something. We're trying to minimize rabbit trails, okay? Sorry. I'm not saying we're making this a standard thing. I'm just saying if you want to do that. Yeah. You know, it's not like new, the, it's not like the new haiku time or anything like that. Okay. It's not like... It's not going to have a theme song or anything? No. Well, then that's worthless. No, There's it's... There's no theme song attached to it. It's, it's worthless. Just one less... Well, maybe. I don't know. We'll see. Whatever. Moving on. Okay. You know, I came into this episode Forget determined it. to to minimize okay. the rabbit trails that I began. So I'm saying let's you. stop. Let's stop minimizing. Let's continue. Okay, let's do so, it. Uh, so Shadow Facts is running as fast as the wind. It says, that's right. <laughs> it's running as fast as a fast horse. <laughs> yes. Um, Trying to get somewhere quickly to deliver copies. That's right. Because the fax machine won't work. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um... Yeah, so tall ships and tall kings. 
This is the poem that oh, Matt referred poem to. Oh, the poem that, yes. Tall ships and tall kings, three times three. What brought them? What brought they from the foundered land over the flowing sea? Seven stars and seven stones and one white tree. I love, yeah, I love, I love yeah, that Yes, this is the poem. poem that Matt referenced in right. his email. He's right, it is. It's like millions of years of history. Right. Summed up in, what, six lines of verse? Yeah. Yeah. Um, thousand, you know, thousands of years, maybe. Uh, I don't know about millions of millions years, but is better. thousands, okay, billions, billions, trillions, yeah, gazillions, a ten to the twenty third, infinity, I was gazillion, think, billion. For some trillions. reason, I was thinking about like in chemistry, you know, you have, you have the mole, you have a mole of something, oh, right? Yeah, right, yeah, and that's Avogadro's number, right. Avogadro's constant, right? Which is like, so if you have a mole of some object, which is like the, I think, like a mole, if you had a mole of like carbon, mm-hmm. like C twelve, yeah, it would be like having the I think the molecular weight, uh, like it would, so it would be like having 12 grams of carbon, right? Would be a mole of carbon 12. Okay. Right. So, you know, that's, that's not that much. Like that'd be like a little, just like that much, yeah. just like a little yeah. square of it. Right. Right. Tiny little pile, but that, that would have, um, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd power, uh, atoms of C12. In it. Is that Carbon the number 12. you were talking about? Yeah. That's a lot. That is a that's lot. Like unfa- that's like unfat. That's like... Times 10 that's to like, the 23rd. That's like... That's like 23 A billion, zeros. billion, billions. That's a lot. Well, not quite a billion, billion, billions. It's like... It's like a million, billion, billions. Well, that's atoms. Hmm? That's atoms. So that's how many atoms would be in that amount of grams. Is that what yeah. you're saying? Okay. Yeah, I think it's... So it's like... Nine would be billion. Twelve would be trillion. 15 would be quadrillion, 18 would be quintillion, 21 would be sextillion. So it's like almost, it's like almost a quadrillion or no, septillion atoms. You lost me. You lost me at quadrillion. I know it's... But it's it's kind of mind-boggling. Unfathom. Like in just in that little bit, that's how small atoms are. Man, I don't know. Unbelievable. And I think that atoms were first... Yeah. Rabbit trail. But what's crazy is that the atoms were first discovered by the Greeks, like in BC. Well, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that they discovered them. I think they theorized. They theorized. That's what I mean. Yeah. They came up with the concept. All right. Before Christ. All right. Should you like to know more about this, then like you know, go listen to Bill Nye or something like that. All right. <laughs> I love Bill Nye. Because we're probably butchering Remember it. When we saw him. No, we didn't. We heck? saw we saw Beekman. Oh, I thought we saw Bill Nye. No, we saw Beekman. Who's Beekman? Beekman's world. Oh, was he like a wannabe Bill Nye? Well, he was, it was like, back in the day, it was like VHS or Beta, right? It was like, who's going to uh, win out? Who's going to win the great obviously science Obviously Bill Nye did because uh, war. I totally forgot about Beekman. Um, yeah, I don't know what happened to Beekman, but Bill Nye is still around. Yep. All right. Um, All right, so. Tall ships and, cool yeah, so, so this poem. is a very, I, I, I get what Matt's saying here. It's a, yeah. it's a. Um, it does have a mystical quality about it. It's like it's from another world. Well, that's, I mean, that's just what I love about Tolkien yeah, in the first place, right? Yeah, I mean, me too. I mean, it's like, he, to, in order to tell this story, which is like his magnum opus, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. He created thousands upon thousands of thousands years of history. Thousands upon thousands, I know. Right? I know, it's amazing. And that's what I really love about this chapter, is that I feel like, like there's so many references to, like, you, you really get a feel for how vast the world of Tolkien is. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, he's bringing in, um, you know, references from the Silmarillion. Um, he talks about Feanor, right, being the one who possibly wrought the palace right. here. I'm sorry, I may be jumping ahead. No, you're fine. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, but this chapter, this is honestly the first chapter we've read that I've really, like, it made me happy that I'd read the Silmarillion. Mm-hmm. So I was like, oh, I don't know what he's talking about. Yeah. But it really does. It just kind of, it's a little bit mind-blowing to think about, you know, I love how he's kind of tying, you know, this chapter, he's really tying a lot of different aspects of his right. world into one. Well, and I think the the tall ships and tall kings three times three actually refers to um, Elendil and Isildur. Oh, and the one at the end of the Silmarillion? Anat, what's the other mm-hmm. one's name? Anat, I think the other one's name begins with A, but... Uh, but you know, at the end of mm-hmm. uh, with Alcalabeth, really, mm-hmm. when the, mm-hmm. the the exiles from Numenor, mm-hmm. right, come mm-hmm. to come to Middle Earth, 
Um, yes. The I Dunedain. Think you're right about that. Right. Yeah, the Dunedain. Because they come and there's three of them. Mm-hmm. They're Elendil and his two sons, mm-hmm. Isildur being one, and then I forget the name of the other mm-hmm. one. Um, but it begins with an A, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. And then they come in three separate ships. Yeah. Right. Yep. So, um, so I think that's what that's referred to. Um, and they, I think they brought the Palantir, the Palantir from, uh, from Numenor. Okay. And that's you know we learned a little bit about that. Um, Palantir, uh, uh, Pippin says, um, what is that? What is it about the seven stars and seven stones? About the Palantir of the kings of old, said Gandalf. And what are they? The name meant that which looks far away. The Orthanc stone was one. Then it was not made, not made by the enemy? No, said Gandalf. Nor by Saruman. It is beyond his art and beyond Sauron's too. The Palantiri came from beyond Westerness, from Eldamar. The Noldor made them. Fanor himself maybe wrought them in days so long ago that the time cannot be measured in years. Yeah, if you don't know who Fanor, if you never read the Silmarillion, mm-hmm. you're not really sure who Fanor is. Mm-hmm. But now that you've read the Silmarillion, because you've listened to all of the episodes of the Tolkien Road mm-hmm. podcast, you're like, I know all about Fanor. Like, I'm so smart. That's right. Um, I know what his favorite color was. <laughs> um, but there is nothing that Sauron cannot turn to evil uses. Alas for Saruman, it was his downfall, as I now perceive. Perilous to us all are the devices of an art deeper than we possess ourselves. That's a great. That's a great little line. One yeah. I almost skipped over. Yeah, Perilous to us all are the devices of an art deeper than we possess ourselves. I read it three times. I was trying to think if I could make it a haiku, mm. <clears throat> but I couldn't. Well, I mean that that again. You know, it gets back to one of Tolkien's main themes, and that's the the like our rush to want to mm-hmm. like turn, discover, like um, especially yeah. in the modern world, like. The, the machine, right? Like, mm-hmm. affecting what once would seem magic by by technology. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, you know, you think about how far stuff's come since Tolkien's time. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's mind-boggling. It is. The things we have. And, um, I don't know, like, there's just so much, there's so much stuff going on now, and it's like, you know, probing the, the very, like... Just, just all these fun, like, fundamental laws and, like, changing the, changing the nature of things and... Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's just yeah, GMOs. And I feel like hybrid, I, I feel whatever. like that needs to be on a T-shirt and like you know, mm-hmm. perilous to us all are the devices of an art deeper than we possess ourselves. Yes, it's just kind of like don't go above for pay grade. Yeah. Right. Well, and it's like don't really go matters that are too really like too high. <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know. It'd be worthwhile doing an episode all of its own on that on that very subject, but um, yeah. You know, it's just a, it's just a question of respecting the nature of things. I feel like you know absolutely, and 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 also um, knowing your own shortcomings, right? Mm-hmm. Your own boundaries. Yeah. Right. You no, know, this is this is too this is too much. Yeah. This could, you know, I need to not go there, mm-hmm. right? Because it's just it's above it's above me, right? right. Like it, nothing good could come from me trying to mess with that exactly because it's just something i wasn't meant to be involved with um preach it all right yeah so know your limits people um yet he must bear the blame fool to keep it secret for his own profit no word did he ever speak of it to any of the council we had not yet given thought to the fate of the palantiri of gondor and its ruinous wars by men they were almost forgotten even in gondor they were a secret known only to a few in Arnor, they were remembered only in a rhyme of lore among the Dunedain. What did the men of old use them for? asked Pippin, delighted and astonished at getting answers to so many questions and wondering how long it would last. I think it's Pip- like Pippin's kind of one of his main problems. It's a good thing, but it's also one of his main problems mm-hmm. is that he's so curious about everything. Curiosity we see that, killed the cat. Um, there's that line in a little bit where it says, The names of all the stars. Gandalf asks him, What else do you want to know? The names of all the stars and of all living things and the whole history of Middle Earth and, above, and over heaven and of the sundering seas. I want to know everything. That's basically mm-hmm. what he says. Well, that's not a bad thing in and of itself. It's not. Yeah, but it's um, you know, it's it's kind of your impatience in trying to acquire all that right. knowledge. That that's be the true. Problem. That's true. No, I I feel him. I mean, I'm totally I'm wired the same way. Yeah. Um. Uh. So. Uh, in response to Pippin asking what did the men of old use them for, Gandalf says, to see far off and to converse in thought with one another. They set up stones at Minas, Ar- Minas Anor and at Minas Ithil and at Orthanc in the rise, ring of Isengard. The chief and master of these was under the dome of stars at Osgiliath before its ruin. 
The three stars were far away. The three others were far away in the north. In the house of Elrond, it is told that they were at Anumanas, and Amansul, and Elendil stone was on the tower hills that look towards Mithlond, in the Gulf of Loon, where the grey ships lie. Each palantir replied to each, but all those in Gondor were ever open to the view of Osgiliath. Now it appears that as the rock of Orthanc has withstood the storms of time, so there the palantir of that tower has remained. But alone it could do nothing but see small images of things far off and days remote. Very useful, no doubt, that was to Saruman, yet it seems that he was not content. Further and further abroad he gazed until he cast his gaze upon Barad-dûr. Then he was caught. Who knows where the lost stones of, stones of Arnor and Gondor now lie, buried or drowned deep? But one at least Sauron must have obtained and mastered to his purposes. I guess that it was the Ithil stone, for he took Minas Ithil long ago and turned it into an evil place. Minas Morgul it has become. So, <clears throat> uh, so Gandalf thinks that Sauron has taken the stone from Minas uh, Ithil. Right. Which, you know, again, if you kind of look at the different locations. Um, so basically, here in this little area, if you look in the, the, the zoomed-in map of Gondor, where you have Minas Tirith, mm-hmm. Usgiliath, and then Minas Morgul, which is right on the edge of uh, Mordor. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Usgiliath was kind of the capital of okay. Gondor once upon a time. And now it's a ruined city. It was this, like, city on the river, right? Okay. yep. And then you had the, the Tower of the moon and the tower of the sun okay yep um minas tirith and well once upon a time it was minas anor and minas ithil minas ithil was taken and turned into minas morgul that's where he thinks sauron got his stone okay. and then minas anor still has its stone uh and it's minas tirith now we don't know what happened to the stone in Asgiliath, but maybe sauron has that too and then there was one in isengard and then there were three others that were far north okay. so uh next week we're actually going to do our episode on um, the Palantiri from uh, Untold Tales, as you call it. Oh, yeah. Sweet. Unfinished Tales. Yes. So there's a whole chapter on the Palantiri in there that we're going to focus oh, okay. on. So I don't awesome. want to... We'll, we'll talk more about the Palantiri um, on that next episode. Sweet. <clears throat> but um, but suffice to say... Um, this is how they communicated with each other. This is how they communicated with each other. And they this weren't intended how, to be used for evil. This is how Saruman and Sauron uh, knew each other. Right. And and it's and Gandalf in summary says, Easy it is now to guess how quickly the roving eye of Saruman was trapped and held, and how ever since he has been persuaded from afar and daunted when persuasion would not serve. The biter bit, the hawk under the eagle's foot, the spider in a steel web. How long, I wonder, has he been constrained to often to come often to his glass for inspection and instruction? And the Orthanc stone so bent towards Barador that if any save a will of adamant now looked into it, it will bear his mind and sight swiftly thither, and how it draws one to itself. Have I not felt it? Even now my heart desires to test my will upon it, to see if I could not wrench it from him and turn it where I would, to look across the wide seas of water and of time to tarry on the fair, and perceive the unimaginable hand and mind of Feanor at their work, while both the white tree and the golden were in flower. He sighed and fell silent. I wish I had known all this before, said Pippin. I had no notion of what I was doing. We'll come back to that in a second, but um, so it, it's interesting to think about Saruman, you know, maybe trying to use the Palantir at first to for some kind of good, you know, and trying to maybe like perceive better of what Sauron's plans were with so it. That he could thwart him, right? Yeah, and then getting kind of snare, snared by him mm-hmm. in whatever way, mm-hmm. and um, and then maybe even being so prideful and so ashamed of the fact that he got snared by Sauron that he was unwilling to share it with any of the other wise, right? Any of the other wizards or any mm-hmm. of, um, or like Galadriel or Elrond or anybody like that, right? And that's why the members he started of the White doing Council. his own thing. Too. Yeah, and that's why he kind of kept so much hidden and was doing mm-hmm. all this maneuvering, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's just interesting to think about like the, the operations of evil, right? Yeah. And temptation and yeah. keeping things secret and all that kind of stuff. You know, nothing good happens in the shadows. That's right. Nothing, yeah, yeah definitely not in the shadows. No. Um, so, uh, yeah, except for shadow facts. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, except for shadow facts. Yeah. He's the one exception to the he rule. He's the one shadow that is a mm-hmm. good shadow when it comes to all he this He is stuff. a good shadow, yes, but most of the time, you know, you don't want to be called shadowy. Right. Because usually shadows imply evil. Yeah. 
dark, dark mischief. Okay. Um, coming back to Pippin saying, I had no notion of what I was doing. Gandalf says, oh, yes, you did. You knew you were behaving wrongly and foolishly, and you told yourself so, though you did not listen. Mm-hmm. I did not tell you all this before, because it is only by musing on all that has happened that I have at last understood, even as we ride together. But if I had spoken sooner, it would not have lessened your desire or made it easier to resist. On the contrary, no. The burned hand teaches best. After that advice about fire... After that advice... After that, advice about fire goes to the heart. Um, so it's the old... Um, you know, it's the old excuse, like, you know, oh, I didn't know this would give me all this I'd trouble. Known, yeah. Right? If only you told me all this before, then I would have known, right. you know, all the problems. Right. And Gandalf yeah. is basically like, well, I didn't know all this stuff would happen, but even then, like, why didn't you just trust me? Right? right. Exactly. If I, even if I had known all this stuff and told you, that would have just made you want to look even more. Right? True. And I kind of wonder, too, just about, you know, we're getting some insight a lot into Pippin's personality here. And it seems like he's he, he's kind of got the streak of, of pridefulness, mm-hmm. and and I wonder oh, sure. how much of the fact that um, you know him being insulted by Saruman, mm-hmm. right, and having Gandalf just snatch, you know, he's like, I'm the one that saved it from rolling down the hill, and he just grabbed it from me, and, right? You know, that's kind of like. You know, I think that's an easy trap for all of us to fall into. Mm -hmm. To kind of be like, well, what about me? You know, like, who do they think they are? They can just talk to me that way and treat me like that and just not give me any thanks for helping, you know? And so I wonder how much of that kind of fueled his desire to get get it, you know, and to look into it. Yeah. No, I think, I mean, I think he definitely has a little bit of uh, pride, as do we all Mm -hmm. in our own ways. Mm -hmm, mm Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, I, no, I think it's sure. good. I think it's good yeah. thought. Yeah. Um. So, uh, Pippin asks if the Nazgul, the Black Rider, was coming for him. Mm-hmm. Um. And Gandalf says, "Of course not. It is two hundred leagues or more in straight flight from Barad-dûr to Orthanc, and even a Nazgul would take a few hours to fly between them." So, in answer to our previous question, no, he was not actually seeing the Nazgul depart as a result of him. Uh... Now he still may have been seeing that happen recently, but. It wasn't necessarily coming for him. It wasn't because him. he looked into the palantir. Right. Okay. Um, but Saruman certainly looked in the stone, uh, in the stone since the orc raid, and more of his secret thought, I do not doubt, has been read than he intended. A messenger has been sent to find out what he is doing, and after what has happened tonight, another will come, I think, and swiftly. So Saruman will come to the last pinch of the vice that he has put his hand in. He has no captive to send. He has no stone to see with, and cannot answer the summons. Sauron will only believe that he is withholding the captive and refusing to use the stone. It will not help Saruman to tell the truth to the messenger, for Isengard may be ruined, yet he is still safe in Orthanc. So whether he will he will or no, he will appear a rebel. Yet he rejected us so as to avoid that very thing. What he will do in such a plight, I cannot guess. He has power still, I think, while in Orthanc, to resist the Nine Riders. He may try to do so. He may try to trap the Nazgul, or at least to slay the things on which it now rides the air. In that case, let Rohan look to its horses. Um, But I cannot tell how it will fall out, well or ill for us. It may be that the counsels of the enemy will be confused or hindered by his wrath with Saruman. It may be that he will learn that I was there and stood upon the stairs of Orthanc with hobbits at my tail, or that an heir of Elendil lives and stood beside me. If Wormtongue was not deceived by the armor of Rohan, he would remember Aragorn, the title that he claimed. That is what I fear, and so we fly, not from danger, but into greater danger. Every stride of Shadowfax bears you nearer to the land of shadow Peregrine took. Um, so, the you know, of shadow. it doesn't necessarily mean that the, you know, the rider was coming for him, but it, it doesn't mean anything good either. You well, know, no, it's it, definitely bad if anything, <clears throat> if anything, it just means that they need to be even quicker. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so Pippin thinks that they were, thought that they were going to stop at Helm's Deep. Gandalf mm-hmm. says, nope, we're on to Minas Tirith before the seas of war surround it. And, uh, and it's a long way, leagues upon leagues. A lot further than Helm's Deep. Yeah, right. thrice as far as the dwellings of King Theoden at Edoras, and they are more than a hundred miles east from here as the messengers... And, the, and and they are more than a hundred miles east of, from here as the messengers of Mordor fly. Shadow, facts, must run a longer road, which will prove the swifter. We shall ride now till daybreak, and that is some hours away. Then even Shadow, facts, must rest in some hollow of the hills, at Edoras, I hope. Sleep if you can. 
You must see the first glimmer of dawn upon the golden roof of the house of Aeorl. And in two days thence you shall see the purple mount shadow of Mount Mendoluin, and the walls of the tower of Denethor white in the morning. Um, so I like this last little bit here. As he oh, fell yeah. slowly into sleep, Pippin had a strange feeling. He and Gandalf were still as stone, seated upon the statue of a running horse, while the world rolled away beneath his feet with a great noise of wind. So it feels to me like Pippin's somewhat at peace after yeah. all of this there. Yeah. He seems to be recovering. Even um, Gandalf says that hobbits have a remarkable... Yeah. What, you know, a remarkable means of recovery. So yeah, it seems like no uh, no severe damage. Yeah, this made me think of the, the the ending. There made me think of the Robert Frost poem, <laughs> "Stopping by the Wood." Stopping by woods on a snow evening. I don't um, know that. One. You know, it's the one that ends um, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles uh, to go before I sleep. Okay. Right. I actually okay. just talked about that in, in my class again, one of my classes this week. Um, that particular poem. Oh really? Yeah. Huh. Um, but. You know, I was thinking, and leagues to go before we sleep, and leagues to go leagues before to we go sleep. Before Except we Pippin sleep. will fall asleep now. Yeah. So. He's on Shadowfax, being protected by Gandalf. He's got mm. nothing to fear. That's right. He's in a good place. Um. All right. <clears throat> Any other thoughts on the chapter? Um. No, I think. Um. So. Why did he change his mind about going to Minas Tirith as opposed to? Home's deep. Um, to try to protect it from. Yeah, well, I think he realizes that with the Nazgul coming, that war is upon. That that the armies of Sauron are have already or are about to cross the river okay. of Anduin, and it's and it's that much more important that he get to Minas Tirith, and speak to Denethor and tell him that, you know, let him know everything that's going on, right? Okay. So. Yeah. Gotcha. So okay. that's the last we're going to see for a while of um, Gandalf and uh, Pippin and the rest of the Fellowship, right? Oh, because now we're going back to uh, Frodo and Sam. Because now, book four, we're heading back Yay. to Frodo and Sam. Now, we are going to take, we're going to hit pause on Lord of the Rings for the next few episodes. Okay. Um, and uh, we're going to, next episode, we're going to cover the Palantir from Unfinished Tales. Um, so, you know, um, uh, we won't. We're we're not going to do. I'll come back to the more details on that. But then we're going to do a couple of other interstitial things. Okay. And then we'll um, and then we'll come back to uh, Lord of the Rings um, for too long. Probably starting early in March. Okay. That's my guess. So. Sounds like a plan. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, haiku time. You know it. Uh, me first. Yeah. All right. Do it. Go for it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 syllables and haiku. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 syllables and haiku. Well done. All right. All righty, Rudy. Um... So, I'm going to write down something new here. Well, why don't you go first? Or do we want to do paper, rock, scissors? Um, rock, paper, scissors. Yes, do rock, paper, scissors. Okay. Rock, rock, paper, paper scissors, scissors, shoot. shoot. Rock, rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Oh, Boom. Fledge ripples. <clears throat> rock, beat, scissors. <clears throat> All right. Uh, you go first. All right. Here's my haiku for the Palantir. Ancient seeing stones. Harnessed elvish power. Draws in an honest fool. Nice. Mm-hmm. Nice. Oh, that was pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. Um, all right, here's mine. Yeah. Seeing stones, or seeing stone, falls to the ground like forbidden fruit. Fool of a took takes. Mm. Nice simile, John. Yeah. Nicely. Thanks. Nicely done. Seeing stone falls to the ground like a large stone. Like a large rock. <laughs> like a large rock. Fool of a took takes. Oh, nicely done. I like it. All right, uh, so listener haikus, Rob's going to start us off. He writes, Brought by kings of old, seven stars and seven stones, and the one white tree. Boom. Yep. 
Pretty good. Awesome. Thank you, Rob. Wonderful as always. Yes, indeed. Um, Mary Grace, she sent two. I'm going to read the one in English, and you can read the one in Elvish. Okay. I didn't even think about trying to translate the Elvish one. Yikes. Oh, well. Well, here we go. Well, <clears throat> she should have sent us a translation. Yeah, well... I mean, I, I don't know. Confused. Well, you know, we aren't the language experts. But. No. Maybe... Maybe she'll send us the one. Maybe she'll send us the translation for next episode. If you yeah, said Mary Grace, send us the translation for next episode. Yeah. Let's not try to translate it right here. Okay, let's not. I'm okay. trying to think because she sent me one, and then she was like, "Disregard that one." So I was wondering. No, there's not a translation in that one either. Okay. All right. Well, here's Mary Go- Mary <laughs> Mary Grace's English haiku. Old palantiri are that which look far away, made in Eldamar. Nice. Yeah. Awesome sauce. I'm sensing a theme. Mm hmm. Yeah. Here's her elvish one. Atso elini. I atso sardi imini. Ninque alda. I'll try that again. Otso elini. I atso sardi imini. Ninque Alda. That's beautiful. Yes. Yes, indeed. I have no idea what it means. I would just really like to know what it means now. <laughs> yeah. So let us know, Mary Grace. Yeah, send us a translation. Mm-hmm. Please. What is that? Let's do the nine. No. Oh. Hmm. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, please, your, um... The suspense is killing us. Yes. All right. Um... But thank you. Thank you. Very much. All right, I'm going to save Matt's for last since he has the poem. So next we go to Josh, super fan Josh. What's up? Um, all right, here's his IQ, haiku number one. Fainorian, the far-seeing stones of old, lost to time or war. Um, I like the Fainorian. Yes, yes indeed. It's kind of like harkens back to his Odysseus and what did he say? Odyssean. Odyssean? No. Od- Odyssean? Odyssean? Was yeah. it Odyssean or Odi? No, Odyssey esque. Remember he mentioned Odyssey yeah, in the right, Odyssey? Right, yeah. 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 Anyway. Oh, I gotta read the second one, okay. Yeah, you gotta read the second one. Sauron caught a glimpse. He saw into Pippin's mind a big empty space. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> uh, poor Pippin. Oh, man. No Pippin respect. Is such a bad rap. That's right. But thanks for the laugh, Josh. Fool of a took. All right. Um, so I'll read. So Matt sent us three haiku and a poem. So I'll read the... Uh, do you want to read the poem? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, so I'll read the, the three haiku. Okay. All right, I, haiku number one from Matt Scarrens. The white hand fallen. Ents do not forget details. Unlike Saruman. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Was right that on. like a... <clears throat> I can't talk. Were you <clears throat> Was that like an, a reverse simile? Is there such thing as a reverse simile where he says, unlike Saruman? Um, I don't know if there was such a thing. I guess, I mean, I, I guess it's a... I guess you could call it a reverse simile or an anti-simile. Anti, I like anti-simile. Yeah. You read the second one. Okay. Not always evil. Work of old a Fanor brought from Numenor. Mmm, nice. nice. These are all so good. Mm-hmm. All right, number three from Matt. In the Palantir, does Pippin look unwisely? You fool of a took. Mmm, fool yes. of a took. Fool of a took. Well done, <coughs> Matt. <coughs> Bless you, John. Thank you. And I will give you the honor of reading Matt's poem. Awesome. For the end of book three. Alrighty. And here's a poem for the end of book three by Matt Scarrance. The road goes ever on and on, far from the shire where it began. Far ahead, Frodo and Sam are gone. The rest must follow as they can. Defeated now is Saruman's horde, and evil thwarted for the day. Still the hours come for the sword, and ever dark the high king's way. In Palantir the eye is seen, oft evil will shall ever mar. 
Now Gandalf rides in dark unseen to warn Gondor of the war. The foolish took he brings along to ride beneath the break of dawn to Minas Tirith, renowned in song. The road goes ever on and on. Boom. That's awesome. Awesome. Love it. Oh, man. That's so great. Yes. Thanks, Matt. That is great. Love that the was... uh, love the use of the road goes ever on. Yes, absolutely. It's a great way to sum up. Mm-hmm. Sum up book three. Mm-hmm. Thank thank you to everyone. Yes. Who sends in haiku and correspondence? We love hearing from y'all. Yeah. So for uh, for next time, we're we're not uh, not planning on doing haiku for the next next few episodes because they are um, not in reference to actual chapters. You can you can still send us and uh, you know we might we might go ahead and read them. Uh, we're not going to do any for those chapters on like the Palantiri and mm-hmm. whatever else we do. Um, Wait, why would they send them if we're not going to read them? If they send them, we might read them. I don't know. Oh, you know? okay. Um, but uh, you know what? Just go and send them if you want to, and we'll read them. That's yeah. all I'm saying. Life's more fun with haiku. Yeah, maybe we'll do them. Maybe we'll just be like, whatever. Let's just do haiku. Maybe. Maybe we'll do, like, um, impromptu haiku. Yeah. We'll just make it up on the spot. That sounds challenging. I think that would be fun. All right. Um, it be, like, last comic standing, but it would be last poet standing. That's right. That's mm-hmm. right. Yeah, so for next time, Unfinished Tales, The Palantiri. That's what you need to read if you want to know what we're going to be talking about. And, um, yeah. Yeah? Is that a wrap? That's a wrap. Awesome. Thank you guys uh, th- for listening. Thanks again to our patrons, uh, oh, Shannon yes. Stockbridge, Josh Sosa, William Hutton, Brian Orr, Margaret Lyon, Emilio Perea, Zeke Farmer, Caleb Santana, and James Applegate. Thank you. You guys rock. You guys are awesome sauce. And um, and thanks for listening, everyone. We will yes. talk at you next Every time. Every one of you. Thank you. We appreciate you. Yes, we do. Yeah. We'll talk at you next time, guys. Peace out. Bye, y'all. Please remember to check out truemyths.org and tolkienroad.com for show notes and plenty of other Tolkien goodness. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, would you please leave the Tolkien Road rating and feedback on iTunes? It's a great way to support the show and takes less than a minute. On our next episode, we'll take a pause from our journey through The Lord of the Rings and do a focused look at the origin and nature of the Palantiri, the Seeing Stones of Numenor. For this discussion, our primary text will be the Palantiri chapter from Unfinished Tales. Thanks for listening, and until next time, the road goes ever on.